Namaskar and welcome to Indian Diplomacy show on uh, Doordarshan India's national television channel about uh, India's foreign policy, India's uh, involvement in shaping the emerging world order, India's key partnerships and important challenges that India faces as it rises to take its due place in the international order. Viewers, uh, in this episode, we are looking at the phenomenon of geopolitical triangles. Uh, the most important one, of course, being China, India, and the United States. Geopolitical triangles uh, is a concept where the relationship between any two of the three players has an impact on the third, and vice versa. And uh, it's a very complex uh, concept, but also fairly well understood in the realm of international relations. To discuss geopolitical triangle uh, in the Indo-Pacific in particular, uh, I have with uh, me a very special guest, uh, Professor Srikanth Kondapalli. Professor Srikanth Kondapalli is Dean of the School of International Studies at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University and uh, a very eminent Sinologist and uh, China expert uh, in India. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on Indian Diplomacy, Professor Kondapalli. Thank you very much for the invite. To start with, when we talk about the China, India, United States triangle, the, you look at the dyads within the triangle. Uh, there is the India-China relationship, which has uh, become more uh, t uh, tense and uh, conflicted. There is the India-United States relationship, which is becoming closer and more strategic uh, in terms of alignment. And then there is the biggest dyad of them all, which is the China-US, the great power rivalry and the competition that's hotting up. So um, to in many ways, the triangle, I think the base of it is the China-US rivalry, which sets the tone for India's strategies and options. So I'd like to begin with your thoughts on the state of the big great power relationship today. And uh, it's a defining one, obviously. And uh, although President Biden and uh, uh, President Xi have met, they, uh, President Biden says that we, we want uh, to avoid uh, conflict, you know, and we want to avoid a Cold War. But structurally, it seems like the two are heading for more and more, uh, you know, extreme competition, if not outright war. So, uh, how do you think that is going, and how is that impacting uh, on India? I think to start with, the uh, triangle began roughly around when uh, Henry Kissinger visited China in '71, and uh, President Nixon's visit to Beijing. Uh, that led to a strategic transformation. But the focus at the time was uh, joint disintegration of the Soviet Union, mm. uh, which was quite successful by 91, 92. Uh, and this has also created avenues for other bigger triangles and permutations and combinations. But gradually, as the Chinese uh, have also grown up, uh, China rise has happened in the meanwhile. Uh, and it is today a $19 trillion economy compared to about $24 trillion American economy, GDP-wise. Mm. So this has also led to a change in the uh, tectonics. And uh, uh, as the 19th Communist Party Congress began by saying that they want to occupy the center stage uh, in the world, in, in, the world mm. uh, in international order and regional orders, uh, the Americans were alerted for the hegemonic designs of China. Uh, and so we now see a gradual shift in this uh, uh, system uh, where the United States is looking for Asian stability. And uh, in this, uh, India plays a bigger role, even compared to its allies like Japan, South mm. Korea, Singapore, Australia, because of the strategic depth that India has in terms of population, in terms of growth rates. We are now the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, in terms of technology diffusion, in terms of the geopolitical location in the Indian Ocean region. So all these combine for a, a, a rethinking in the US, which was reflected in 2005 when Condoleezza Rice mentioned that United States want to help India to become a, a bigger power. power. Yeah. Because the Chinese ambitions have increased substantially as they grew to be the second largest economy. There is also this rethinking in the US uh, on what should they do. And they found India as one of the major bets uh, for this stability in Asia. And uh, Professor Kondapalli, the Chinese leadership is often quoted as saying that the East is rising and the West is declining. And uh, it's somewhat contradictory because they're also highly insecure about uh, what they see as the West uh, ring fencing them. 
uh, or uh, trying to hem them in. But on the other hand, they also exude a lot of uh, overconfidence that they are actually going to be number one. And uh, it's quite clear the ambition of Xi Jinping is to be number one ahead and to overtake the United States in all parameters of power. So uh, on that front, clearly they are also, then the Chinese are also seem to be looking at this triangle quite differently than before. Because earlier, uh, the view was that they hardly cared for India and did not see it at all as a competitor. But now with India uh, looking to catch up and uh, with the strategic gap likely to reduce in the next decade or so, I think the Chinese also are now, uh, will have to reevaluate just as Americans have done uh, how to deal with the US and that's the, of course their biggest challenge. They still want the Western technology, they still want Western capital. But on the other hand, they are quite wary of the growing closeness between India and the, and the US. Well, two strands of thought in the Chinese foreign policy. One, a lot of propaganda saying that, oh my God, everybody is ganging up against me. Uh, there is some substance to it because in 1950s, there was the US trade embargoes uh, that were imposed on China as part of the containing communism. Uh, however, because the Chinese are today one of the biggest trading partners of the United States, mm. over $780 billion, uh, compared to China's trade with India of $125 billion, or India's trade with the United States of roughly around that amount. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the angle that you mentioned, US-China, that's pretty strong and strategic in nature. If you look at the people-to-people -people contacts prior to the COVID-19, there were over 6,000 people transiting between China and the United States or vice versa, uh, compared to about 300 between India and China a day. If this suggests that there is more depth in China-US relations than say China-India or India-US relations. Uh, but the strand in Chinese foreign policy is that they keep raising this bogey of, uh, you know, everybody is going to contain China. Mm. Uh, and uh, so they suggest to, uh, a concept which Chow Enlai suggested, which uh, Chiang Zemin and currently Xi Jinping uh, have subscribed to is, they call it as Chu Tung Chu Yi or finding commonalities. Mm. So in other words, for India, they suggest, let us be together in WTO, in climate change issues, in multipolarity, in BRICS, in SEO and so on and so forth. On the other hand, they make a deal with the United States for technology, for regional security issues. Remember, during Obama's visit to China in November 2009, there was the mention about China and the United States will rule the roost in South Asian security issues. Yes, uh, the so-called so G2, Indeed, we called it G2, yeah. yeah. So this suggests they make a deal with the United States mm. uh, at the cost of the relations with India or other countries. So this is one streak that is quite prominent. Uh, and specif specifically when whenever the Indian side is coming closer to in its natural uh, allies uh, relationship with the United States, the Chinese keep bombarding with this uh, commonality or Chu Tung Chu Yi concept mm. uh, and trying to wean away India from the United States or other countries. Uh, so this trend is important for them to raise this bogey of containment. Mm. Although Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, suggested to Hu Chintao that India is not part of the containment. Uh, and We still say that we are not into those outdated Cold War concepts when Indeed. we approach. But, but the Chinese are uh, getting testy on this India-US relationship. And viewers, uh, I have a very interesting um, video package for you uh, about the Chinese objections to joint uh, India-US military exercises. Let's watch that and continue the discussion.
exercises that are going on with the U.S., I think, in Oli. These have nothing to do with the 1993 and 1996 agreements that was asked in the question. Uh, but since these were raised and we're talking about them and the, it was raised by the Chinese side, let me emphasize that the Chinese side needs to reflect and think about um, its own breach of these um, agreements of, of 1993 and 1996. India exercises with whomsoever it chooses to and it does not give a veto to third countries on this issue. Viewers, uh, you just heard a spokesperson of India's External Affairs Ministry saying that we have a right to do military exercises with whoever we can and want to, and there's no uh, uh, position or privilege for China to veto what we do. In other words, uh, Professor Kondapalli, this is just a reflection. You go back in time, uh, for a long time, the Chinese have been raising objections that, you know, India, Mao, in Mao's time, they used to say India is a, you know, running dog of uh, Western imperialism. And even now, their commentariat, their state media, the official, they keep on saying that India is a pawn that is being used by the US. They have this ideological conviction that uh, India is just being exploited. It's, uh, they say it's like a passive object that uh, is going to be used and thrown away by the US. And they do this with other um, Asian allies and uh, partners of the US also. They keep saying we can have uh, you know beneficial mutual uh, community of shared destiny, common destiny and all these things. Why do you want to bring in these outsiders? Asia must be for Asians and all that. So they're quite uh, insecure, especially with the growing military ties between the US and its partners, especially India. And we just saw one example of that. So uh, do you think the Chinese are insecure about this because they feel like the balance of power uh, which they would prefer in a so-called harmonious Asia where they are the dominant players of where, where they have hegemony, that is likely to be spoiled because of the U.S. factor and therefore they keep warning India. Apparently the Pentagon says that even the U.S. has been warned by the Chinese not to interfere in India-China relations. So uh, it does so show that the Chinese fear that a combination of countries is out to get them. Uh, two aspects to it. One is propaganda. Uh, there is a lot of propaganda that the Chinese uh, have been doing it. Uh, for example, Chinese conduct military exercises with Pakistan, uh, they, but they uh, they don't listen to any Indian uh, concerns. Uh, specifically, these are related to Arabian Sea uh, or even in uh, areas closer to the Karakoram Highway and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, they don't listen to the Indian concerns on this. Uh, number two is uh, there is, of course, the insecurity that is created uh, because partly because of the uh, the uh, uh, their own uh, uh, propaganda as well as their own agenda. For example, Xi Jinping in the Shanghai summit meeting of the SICA in May 2014 mentioned that Asian, Asian countries should not seek help from the United States. Mm. Uh, obviously, China is number one in Asia in all parameters, uh, defense budget, economy, technology, uh, kind of market uh, that they have or uh, in any of these parameters. So they want to control Asia and, uh, and also uh, they want to clinch matters on the sovereignty and territorial integrity issues in so Taiwan disputes, Straits, yeah. South China Sea, Sankoku Islands, India-China border areas or others uh, to the detriment of all these small countries like Vietnam, Philippines or others. Mm -hmm. So there is that strand that is visible in the Chinese thinking. Um, uh, which is r relatively uh, a uh, you know cold war thinking uh, within china uh, but the most important aspect here uh, the, is that the chinese themselves had military relations with the united states uh, way back in the 1980s william perry opened up a shop in china uh, for selling mm. arms to the chinese and 450 million dollars of arms were transferred at that time including the head up display systems the super frelons the Black Hawk helicopters, which are deployed in Tibet. Uh, and now they are saying that India is importing a lot of arms from the United States. Yeah. Uh, the US-China military relations could not take off because of the Tiananmen Square incident, the democracy issue, the human rights related issue. Uh, but that is a domestic problem between uh, with China, which the United States has penalize the uh, the Chinese mm. on that count. Uh, nothing to do with, say, uh, India-China relations or India-US relations. 
So, from the point of view, vantage point of view of a 780 billion dollar uh, uh, trade, trade with, yeah. uh, but no between military two countries. Yeah. So, this suggests that they are basically suggesting that other countries should not have good relations with the United States. Only the Chinese can have those relations with the United States, including in the military field. And, and uh, Professor Kondapalli, it seems like if you read the long, the border dispute we've had and which has flared up again in recent years with China, they seem to be using it as a pressure tactic to wean India away from the US. I mean, in other words, it's like a linkage. The, it's not so much the uh, particular piece of uh, real estate high up in the Himalayas. Uh, it's more about, like you said, to bend everybody to their will and to use different ways and means by which to pressurize countries like India. So I think uh, they're la in the larger scheme of things, they believe that India, US, they are now major defense partners and all that. That will uh, hamper their um, supremacy. And therefore, they will use other means, uh, cruder tactics, including violence at the border, to try and push us back uh, from the US embrace. Indeed, one of the 16 reasons why the Chinese have done what they've done in Galwan is the improving relations between India and the United States, uh, specifically in the military dimension, the kind of arms that we purchase from the United States uh, and other aspects of the bilateral relationship. So, uh, the Chinese argument here is that uh, uh, India should not have uh, relations with the United States. Uh, uh, these can only be reserved for the Chinese to explore, not for other countries to explore that kind of relations. Uh, when we look at, say, for example, the Chinese commentary in Global Times uh, or in People's Daily, they have been mentioning about the United States as a key variable in the actions that they have taken in Galwan. Mm. So, this is a kind of veto that they want to exercise uh, that no country in Asia should evolve relations with the United States. Uh, although United States is clearly the uh, global leader in terms of technology, in terms of uh, economic opportunities, uh, in terms of other, uh, you know, soft power or other tools. So, every nation would like to uh, approach the United States to tap some of these resources, uh, which the Chinese do not want to, uh, you know, permit. Yeah. Uh, so, in other words, this veto on Asia uh, is uh, actually a hegemonic design from the Chinese point of view. Yeah, it is to block uh, countries like India from having their own sovereign choices and that's a serious problem. Uh, viewers, we have talked about the Chinese uh, view and the perspective on India-US relations. But let's also uh, focus a bit on what the US thinks. And uh, on this, I have a couple of interesting uh, comments by the US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin about the importance of India to the United States. Uh, let's hear that and continue. The US and India relationship is a stronghold of a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Prime Minister Modi has stated that India stands for freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight and unimpeded lawful commerce and adherence to international law. Now this is a resounding affirmation of our shared vision for regional security in the Indo-Pacific. And it's clear that the importance of this partnership and its impact to the international rules-based order will only grow in the years ahead. It's been nearly two decades since we signed our first defense framework, and we built the partnership that is now a cornerstone of security in the Indo-Pacific. Today, we are positioning the U.S. and Indian militaries to operate and coordinate closely together across all domains and increasingly across the wider Indo-Pacific. All in support of the rule of law, freedom of the seas, and regional peace and security. And now more than ever, democracies must stand together to defend the values that we all share. We all understand the challenges that we face in the Indo-Pacific. The People's Republic of China is seeking to refashion the region 
and the international system more broadly in ways that serve its author author authoritarian uh, interests. But as we operationalize our defense agreements and take our cooperation to the next level, I believe that we can sustain and strengthen a favorable balance of power in the region. Was a U.S. Defense Secretary saying that the United States uh, strategy is to sustain a favorable balance of power in Asia, especially in the Indo-Pacific? Professor Kondapalli, um, U.S. Um, in building their alliance system and going beyond that now to bringing in India, which is not a formal ally but a, a comprehensive strategic partner, global strategic partner. Uh, clearly, they seem to uh, see this as uh, definitely a strategy to counterbalance, uh, you know, China. Uh, the question really is, um, to what extent can we benefit from this cold, you know, this this so-called new Cold War or the great power rivalry between China and the U.S. And obviously, India is too independent and autonomous a country to tow the U.S. line or to become a junior partner of the U.S. That much is clear. We are, we cannot be. In fact, the Chinese appreciated, quote unquote our independent uh, position on the Russia-Ukraine war, which went against uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, desire. But the point is that um, there is this strategic opportunity. And uh, in the past, we used to say we will be neutral or we'll stay out of Cold Wars and great power confrontations. But I think given the, you know, uh, the zero-sum logic with which the Chinese are approaching us now, uh, it's quite clear that we have to push back. and. The U.S. card is obviously important for us. We seem to be reading the uh, tea leaves correctly this time in history compared to earlier eras. And in this triangle, uh, it's clear. It's like an isosceles triangle where China is uh, far away, and but India and the United States are closer to each other. Well, even though we have signed the LEMOVA, SISMOVA, BECA, and other foundational agreements with the United States, uh, our concern, our priorities are basically uh, acquiring material capabilities uh, technologies uh, and economic growth rates. Uh, I think our fundamental interests are located in that direction. Uh, how to uh, rise in the international system, uh, in GDP, in technology, uh, and uh, uh, you know, elevating our own living standards. So that is the main uh, uh, concern here uh, for India. And the American military technology flow or the space technologies, or in agriculture, or in SNT, mm. or in educational sphere, these are useful for India. Uh, and these have been stated extensively uh, as uh, areas that are good for India in terms of its own rise. But when it comes to the national interests, uh, as we saw during the Ukrainian crisis, uh, India took a different stance. Uh, also in many issues related to the Indo-Pacific and the Quad, uh, for example, in the IPEF, uh, there is the mention about the, uh, the trade related aspects and most important, uh, protection of people from uh, the removal of subsidies. India is a democracy and yeah. India has to look at the electorate concerns first. Uh, and so there is uh, also that factor that needs to be kept in mind. When we yeah, look so, at the so India, US, obviously we don't agree on everything. There are sometimes interests that uh, are uh, you know at odds with each other, but overall it does look like uh, if you look at to the future with this triangle, this isosceles triangle where India and United States are closer, it looks like as the China-U.S. rivalry continues to remain the number one story on the global politics, India-U.S. closeness uh, you can we can foresee it getting you know even stronger over time, almost maybe like a de facto alliance, uh, depending on the Chinese actions and the behavior, but. Uh, Professor Kondapalli, your concluding thoughts on the so-called idea of a grand bargain. Sometimes people say, and the Chinese sometimes dangle that too, saying, you know, you disentangle yourself from the U.S., you become, you know, um, a, a harmonious order player as they want it in Asia. And then, you know, we can settle everything nicely and it'll all be good and it'll be win-win for, uh, for India and China. And uh, don't uh, become a kind of a plaything of the Western imperialism and that kind of thing. Do you think we should ever, in your view, as a strategy question, venture in that direction? Let's say, will they? Do you think they'll make concessions to us on the territorial dispute or in the Indo-Pacific in terms of their encroachment into Indian Ocean in the maritime domain?
you think they will do that if uh, we uh, distance ourselves from the US or do you think actually that will be a sign of weakness and what is the Chinese communist mindset? Will they pounce on us more and impose more conditions on us if we defer to their will? Well, it does not appear that the Chinese would concede on the territorial dispute. In fact, they have actually expanded the territorial area like Tawang, like Galwan, which were never part of China in history, but nevertheless they were claiming all these. Uh, and putting India on the defensive on the territorial dispute and even in the Indian Ocean region. Mm. For example, in South China Sea, they, in the code of conduct, they do not want any extra regional power to be part of the code of conduct discussions on the South China Sea, although we have been heavily dependent on trade in this area. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to the Indian Ocean, they conduct their own conference without India's presence. India is looking at hard-nosed national interests. Mm. Uh, what are in India's national interests? Uh, for example, China's investments in India is $8.2 billion, while the American Spinners. investment is over $100 billion in mm. India. Uh, likewise, if you look at the trade deficit, uh, India-China trade deficit in favor of China is about 65 to $70 billion. But India has a surplus of trade with the United yes. States, some $23 billion of surplus. So hard-nosed approach here in terms of national interest. Uh, who is contributing to India's rise? I think that would be the it's fundamental. It's a no-brainer. Uh, so viewers, uh, the point is um, India-US alignment is likely to grow closer. Professor Kondapalli says that uh, we should not ever compromise on our choices and uh, India's hard-nosed focus on real, uh, on, on real politic and on national interests suggests that in this triangle, uh, we will be closer to the US and uh, further from China and there is no question of ever uh, compromising our autonomy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and that is I think the big picture as we go forward uh, in the decades to come because as India catches up with China there is likelihood of more confrontation conflict with China and there I think the United States will remain indispensable. Of course, India will reserve the right to maintain its strategic autonomy. I want to thank uh, Professor Kondapalli for sharing such amazing insights. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much for the invite. So viewers, I do think about uh, triangles. Uh, these are very fascinating. There are so many from around the world. I think the most defining and the most important one for the coming decades or for this century, I dare say, is uh, China, India, United States uh, and how people maneuver in this triangle and how they reposition themselves and recalibrate uh, their strategies is worth watching. Take care and I'll see you soon.